<laughs> I've learned more Hudson history in the last 45 minutes than uh, <laughs> incredible. Gwen is something. Thank you so much, Senator, for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. I'm going to have to warn you, though, I'm going to start with a difficult, politically sensitive issue. Today is Valentine's Day, <laughs> and you're here with all of us, and not at a romantic dinner with your wife. But I'm going to give you a chance to redeem yourself. I'd like to know what, how did you meet, and what, was, um, what has been her influence on your political career? Well, we met uh, 34 years ago on the beach in Hawaii. I, I just had returned from a Mormon mission in South Africa, went uh, right to Hawaii. BYU has a campus on the north shore of Oahu. Like any good Arizona boy, I threw my stuff in the dorm and ran to the beach. Wherever there's water, you, you go for it. And there was a beautiful girl uh, laying there on the beach. I introduced my name as Jeff Flake. She laughed at my name, and uh, I got the last laugh there. <laughs> but I should mention there's a, a coda to that story. Seven years later, and two kids later, uh, Cheryl and I went back to that exact spot where we met on the beach and reminisced, and then we drove up to the school, which is right there, BYU Hawaii. I said to her, I said, this has changed. I said, that's a new building there on the right. She said, no, that's the library. <laughs> Sorry, Glenn. <laughs> it was new to me. <laughs> so I got a little uh, more serious about school in Provo later where it was cold out. Uh, but uh, my wife has been a tremendous influence on me. She encouraged me to do what I loved, and that was public policy. And we, uh, we got married. Um, two years after we met, and then we went and did an internship in Washington, and then had the opportunity to go back to Southern Africa. I fell in love with Africa and Africa politics uh, when I was there before. And so we got to spend, uh, just my wife and me and our one-year-old son, uh, one year in the country of Namibia, the year that Namibia gained its independence from South Africa. So we were there when they wrote their constitution and when they had their first elections, and uh, as you know, a political junkie, that's uh, nirvana <laughs> to be there. And, and it really made me appreciate and really was a turning point in my life in terms of how I saw the United States and our influence on the world and the positive influence we'd had, we've had on the world. And just one thing there, I, I just remember in I think February of 1990, um, getting Time Magazine there in Namibia. There wasn't, the internet really wasn't there. And, and, and uh, Vaclav Havel, the new president of Czechoslovakia at that time, who just months before had been a prisoner, a political prisoner in jail, and was now the president of a new country. And he had spoken to a joint session of Congress. And he just basically poured out his gratitude for the United States and for what uh, they, we had meant to them and for liberating them once again and you know having the Berlin Wall had just come down Namibia just had its elections and uh, Namibia was modeling its constitution after ours and it just uh, hit home to me um, what an influence we've been around the world and makes me a bit concerned about where we are today in that regard so Anyway, sorry, a long question, <laughs> a long answer to a short question, but my wife, she's in Dallas, Texas right now. Her parents are having an anniversary, and uh, I can't wait to get back to her. Well, thank you for spending tonight with us. Um, I, I want to follow up with another question about someone who I think has been a big influence on you. Uh, the title of your book, Conscience of a Conservative, is an obvious direct echo of Senator Barry Goldwater, uh, book from 1960, Conscience of a Conservative. You also worked as the executive director of the Goldwater Institute. Um, obviously, you've held the, the same Arizona Senate seat as Senator Goldwater. So could you just speak a little bit about his influence on your life and also why you chose to use the title of his book from 1960 for your book um, that was published very recently? Well, thank you. Uh, Barry Goldwater, obviously, in Arizona. He's, he's the man. Um, rugged individualist, 
uh, that uh, I think a lot of us, if we can't identify with them, we certainly try to. I grew up uh, in Snowflake, Arizona, a uh, town uh, founded in 1878 by my great-grandfather, William Jordan Flake, and Erastus Snow came along, and they called it Snowflake for the two of them. I grew up not knowing flake was a pejorative term. Nobody made fun of us there. <laughs> But I have uh, 10 brothers and sisters. I grew up on a cattle ranch. Uh, I have 69 first cousins on my father's side alone. That's how I got elected. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly helps. <laughs> but, but I grew up, you know, just worshiping Barry Goldwater. And uh, to, to, to be able to, in 1992, after coming back from Africa and then going back to Arizona, to run the Goldwater Institute for uh, an eight-year period before I ran for Congress myself, uh, and be able to, and you know, interact with Barry Goldwater. And at one of our annual dinners, we had Barry Goldwater, Margaret Thatcher, and William F. Buckley Jr. in the same room, and that was again a Nirvana <laughs> kind of thing for me. But uh, Barry Goldwater's conscience of a conservative, obviously, is kind of the Bible for conservatives. For years, it's it's really. The, the principles that he outlined have animated the party for a generation. And uh, as George Will likes to say, Barry Goldwater uh, was elected um, 20 years later in the form of Ronald Reagan, and there's a, much to be said about that. But one thing that, that, w that struck me, given the timing when I wrote this book, was that Barry Goldwater and William F. Buckley um, back in you know, 1961, were very concerned about the direction of the party, particularly the John Birchers, uh, the Robert Welsh, and the direction, the, the kind of conspiracy theorists who believed that uh, Eisenhower was a closet communist. And, and some of the, the things that uh, they were worried about kind of rang true today. And, and I thought that uh, that I, I ought to title it the same, and, uh, and it certainly, uh, Goldwater continues to have an influence. There are a few things that I certainly disagreed with his positions on, uh, but by and large, he was uh, certainly a principled individualist, kind of lean libertarian, and that's kind of how I describe my philosophy. Um, one of the things is we talk about uh, Goldwater kind of setting the tone for conservatism, right, is um, obviously uh, dealing a lot with philosophy and principle because that was one thing that Goldwater uh, really held to. I know you do as well. Um, one of those principles that you talk about in your book is the principle of free trade, saying that conservatives uh, have long supported free trade. Uh, you can also argue, though, that the Republican Party historically has had a protectionist bent to it, um, going back to the founding of the party. And I think of two Ohio Republicans, um, granted I'm going back a little ways here, but um, uh, President McKinley was a strong protectionist, and uh, even our Senator Robert Taft, uh, who was called Mr. Republican, uh, had some protectionist uh, leanings. So how do you respond to those today who say that the Republican Party that is adopting more of a protectionist uh, and, and tariff-style trade policy under President Trump. Uh, some are arguing, hey, that's a return, actually, to what the Republican Party was historically. Um, obviously, you dis disagree with, with protectionism and the tariff system and, and favor free trade. So w what is your response to that? Um, you know, uh, one thing with Goldwater, his, you know, he was famous for standing for principle, but one statement that he made that I've always remembered that is not uh, often talked about, and this would apply to 40 issues like trade, he said once, politics is nothing more than public business, sometimes you make the best of a mixed bargain. And uh, that part of Goldwater is often forgotten, but he was a uh, master uh, compromiser in a way, or at least legislator, which requires compromise, particularly in the U.S. Senate. But with regard to free trade, uh, I, the party has not always been the party of free trade. Certainly, the modern Republican Party, uh, over the past uh, three or four decades, when we realized that you know you just can't 
the, the way the world has has evolved in terms of trade uh, with uh, you know global supply chains and everything else uh, multilateral free trade agreements are really where it's at it's difficult I love bilateral trade agreements and you know, we ought to negotiate as many as we can but given the way other countries are operating we've got to do multilateral trade deals which necessitates basically Congress saying to the administration negotiate it and we'll give it an up or down vote and Republicans have always uh, been the, the party that over the past 30 years I should say that supplied you know about 80 percent of the votes that were needed to get TPA or trade promotion authority and then the votes to ultimately approve these trade deals and so the, the party hasn't always been the party of free trade but certainly the modern Republican Party has been and my concern has been I, I think that we we haven't and I think President Trump uh, in his campaign and since his campaign has has really struck a chord on holding, holding China's feet to the fire for example and we Republicans as well as Democrats but particularly Republicans who have pushed free trade so much have not done as good a job as we can in holding their feet to the fire but given where the world is today and given that at this point most countries that we're dealing with have other choices we're not the only game in town um, and uh, you know with the TPP uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership which we stopped negotiating right when the administration changed uh, those countries went on around us afterwards and China is cleaning up and my concern is that uh, countries have choices and the what we didn't want to do is embolden China and by pulling out of these free trade agreements that we were negotiating the countries particularly in Southeast Asia who want to deal with us who want to trade with us now have no other choice but to trade with their big neighbor and so I, I, I am very concerned about our future there and it, the, I mean we are a globalized society now when it comes to trade we can wish it weren't so but that is the case and and if we ignore that and we say we're, we're simply going to isolate ourselves um, then uh, I think that uh, we'll, we'll be left behind and our, our standard of living uh, will will decrease and uh, just protectionism doesn't work <laughs> and we've got to find a way certainly to be tougher but I think using the mechanisms that are there we do pretty well when we push or sue in the WTO uh, we win most of those cases but when you do that you want your allies with you and the problem is right now we're offending some of those same allies that we need to be with us when we confront China and and that's my big concern so you see it as some issues of enforcement you bet you bet I, we, we certainly do need to do a better job using the mechanisms that we have that have served us pretty darn well and I, I can just, just talk about NAFTA for a minute coming from Arizona in particular um, and hearing what we're hearing about the border yes we have border security issues yes we need better barriers yes we need to do a lot of things but we are under historic lows in terms of migration north particularly from Mexico and the reason <laughs> is that NAFTA has served Mexico very well but us too um, we, uh, we as in terms of, of the overall base uh, our trade with Mexico has has ballooned and uh, I, I just I mean for us in Arizona it would be very detrimental if we were to to go back to a protectionist stance the new trade agreement uh, which through a lot of fits and starts will be pretty similar to what NAFTA would have been if we would have done the TPP and modernized NAFTA uh, so I'm glad the negotiators came up with something there but we're in a better situation along the border because of NAFTA and because of trade and if that were to shut off and Mexico's economy were to go into a tailspin then we would really face a lot more pressures on the border than we face today now you argue in your book that especially Trump style Republicans have have lost their way um, it, that they have abandoned key conservative principles 
Now I'm going to ask you for a moment, and, and you make a big point in your book about that you are criticizing your own party and not the other party, but I am going to ask you to be bipartisan for just a minute here in your, in your criticism and ask you about um, the, the current Democratic Party, especially those parts of the Democratic Party that identify as Democratic Socialists. And I'm thinking specifically uh, about the, the Green New Deal that was just released. Um, do you think that those Democratic Socialists and, and those who have put forth the, the, the Green New Deal, are they abandoning uh, democratic principles or are they returning to forgotten democratic principles um, given the title, uh, the New Deal, right? Are they returning to the more the style of FDR uh, Democrats? So uh, what is your thoughts on, on the modern um, democratic socialist movement? Well, I sure, uh, I can appreciate the sentiment uh, to have a, a society that, uh, where there's more equality and certainly address uh, uh, the really huge issue of climate change. I, I'm very much uh, in agreement with uh, uh, the science of, of climate change. We have got to do something. I, I myself, I introduced 10 years ago in the House a, a carbon tax bill. I think that that's the most honest way to do it. Um, and that was the last bill I introduced in the Senate uh, as well as a, a climate tax or basically a revenue neutral climate tax bill. And I would hope that more of my Republican colleagues would would jump on that um, because I think we're losing millennials and we're losing others just just taking the politics of it let alone the policy side of it but I do think that Democrats uh, politically are, are making a big mistake by aligning uh, with those who are calling for something while it's aspirational it's just far too easy to take a, a look at that and say hey uh, they're out there they're out there we may be out there on some of these issues, but on that issue, it's going to affect your pocketbook. It's going to affect your livelihood much more than some of these issues we complain about on the Republican side, the wall or whatever else. And, and I do think that, uh, that it's, it's I, I wouldn't say that uh, Democrats are returning to their roots. I, I don't think that we ever had, Democrats have been a rational policy or a party and, uh, and some of these uh, proposals are simply not rational moving ahead um, and so I yeah I, I'm concerned about that and politically I think they're they're giving a, an opportunity for Republicans to come back and that's why you'll see uh, Mitch McConnell put that bill right on the floor uh, because there are a good number of Senate Republicans who don't always want to align with the White House or what they're doing they want something that where they can be against the Democratic Party and not just defending themselves against what the president is doing. Uh, so uh, politically, I, I do think it's a, a, a mistake to go that far. I think Sherrod Brown recognized that uh, here in Ohio uh, when he deferred on aligning himself with that proposal. Now I'm going to ask you to do a critique of both parties and one, one, uh, one answer here. Um, in your book you say, in the 2016 election, a suffering American working class was ripe for Trump's message of fear. So what I'd like to ask is, how had Republicans, or at least non-Trump style Republicans and Democrats, failed the American working class, which caused them to support Donald Trump? Well, one, uh, on trade, uh, we failed to, to enforce as we should have. Uh, two, on, on immigration, uh, to have a rational policy of immigration which would help the economy, uh, both on uh, allowing for more low-skilled uh, workers to come and giving them an opportunity to return home as well, have a rational system there, but also uh, allowing those with with, uh, uh, with skills that we simply don't have enough of here right now. I introduced years ago something called the, the Staple Act because I've been told by Bill Gates and so many of the tech uh, titans that we ought to staple a green card to every diploma uh, in an with an every graduate uh, with a diploma in one of the STEM fields uh, or a graduate degree. And so we incorporated that in the so-called Gang of Eight bill. That was in there, plus some, 
uh, I think both parties have, have failed to have a, a, a rational um, immigration policy that will uh, benefit our economy. So I, I think there's, there's enough blame to go around, but that one is particularly vexing, um, the, the immigration thing. I, we, I've been working on that for 18 years <laughs> and uh, taken a lot of abuse at home uh, for that issue. But we're, we're no closer now than we were 18 years ago, I'm afraid, in some cases, uh, in some areas, a lot further away. Any thoughts on the declared or rumored presidential candidates for 2020? Um, so kind of two parts here. Will, um, on the Republican side, do you believe that President Trump will face a primary opponent? And then on the Democratic side, as um, many of uh, my Democratic friends have said that there's obviously some uh, difference of opinion there on, on what type of, of candidate they want. So what, um, what type of candidate on the Democratic side do you see appearing? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh -huh. Questions from the audience are usually tough. <laughs> Matt's got it. On the Republican side, I, I'm on record saying from the very beginning, I, I didn't support the, the president during the campaign, and I've had a hard time supporting many of his policies and certainly his style uh, when he was president. I, I hope that he does face a challenge on the Republican side. Um, that, but that's a tall order, because I can tell you right now, the Republican Party is Trump's party. Um, to get through a Republican primary, um, you, you nationally or in most states, uh, you have to be aligned with the president. Uh, and uh, so if the president decides he's going to run, you know, barring something you know, huge that would come out with Mueller or, or, or something else, if he decides he wants to run, it may be a, a shrinking percentage of support, but even if it gets down at 30 or even 27, 25, that's still, uh, remember, those who vote in a Republican primary are a subset of a subset of a subset. And right now, they are with the president uh, strongly. And so if he decides to run, I think uh, there, somebody else running on the Republican side may serve to remind Republicans what uh, conservatism used to be, maybe, um, and what uh, decent politics should be. Uh, that's, that's worthwhile, but it's probably not going to uh, lead to victory on the Republican side. So uh, it's, it's a tall order for any Republican. John Kasich is still talking about it, obviously, and, uh, and Larry Hogan's name has been raised, there may be somebody else that, that comes up, but... Uh, but not you, Senator. I'm, no, I, I think the, the fever needs to cool just a bit. <laughs> and, uh, so I'll take a little break here. Um, but on the Democratic side, boy, there are a number of, of good, compelling candidates. That's the problem. There are a number of them. There are a lot of them. And I, I think some of them are kind of, you know, the energy in the Democratic Party is on the far left just like the energy in the Republican Party is, is uh, on the far right. And so that makes it, it difficult for somebody to say, I'm just going to stick to you know, traditional democratic politics, ones that can win a general. Uh, it's, it's difficult right now, but uh, you know, some of the best candidates may not be in the race yet. Um, I know others are talking. Sherrod is a compelling candidate, not just here, but he can articulate a, you know, a, a message that appeals particularly the working class. Joe Biden uh, certainly uh, is appealing, and uh, he seems like he's, he's ready to go. Um, others who are talked about, Amy Klobuchar just got in officially. Uh, I've worked with Amy on a lot of things. She works well across the aisle. Cory Booker has worked uh, well across the aisle on a number of, of issues. Um, uh, Michael Bennett uh, from Colorado. Michael was one of the the Democrats on the Gang of Eight, and I worked with him about every night for seven months, and there is no uh, just brighter, more committed, um, uh, certainly subtle uh, players in the Senate. It doesn't make, sometimes make for the most dynamic candidate, but he was very, a very good president. So uh, I, uh, I hope that the Democrats put up somebody um, that's more toward the center and, uh, but I can tell you, there is a 
<laughs> it's a diminishing middle. <laughs> I often give tours of the Capitol when friends come to, to Washington, uh, or family. I have a lot of family, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll always go over to the House of Representatives and take them on the, the floor after hours. And uh, they'll always ask, you know, where was your seat? And I'll explain there are no assigned seats in the House. You just sit wherever, but people typically would sit the same place. The, you know, the appropriators up in the corner with John Murtha and uh, the Hispanic Caucus over here. And then I'd point out right near the center aisle, the Blue Dogs um, would sit there because it was literally and figuratively near the center. And uh, I, when I was elected in 2000, uh, there were a good number. It was a big group of Blue Dogs, 30 or so. Now you can count them on one hand, a half a hand. And uh, the, the same is true, but maybe a little less pronounced, or at least there wasn't a name for them on the Republican side. Uh, and, uh, and all the incentives are really to, to go to the edges. And uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not been good for politics overall. Maybe we can talk about some of that. You, you write about a lot in your book and have demonstrated by your actions the importance of bipartisanship. You even spent a week on a remote island in the Pacific Ocean with Senator Martin Henrick, a Democrat from New Mexico, proving that senators from different parties can work together, at least if they have to survive, right? <laughs> uh, can you tell us about your experience on the Marshall Islands? Uh, that was actually filmed for the television show Rival Survival. <laughs> you thought he was joking, didn't you? <laughs> well, this all started, well, long ago. <laughs> Growing up on a dry, dusty ranch, I just wanted water. And uh, I loved to read uh, mostly you know, adventure stories, but uh, sailing adventures gone bad. That was my favorite genre. And I always wondered uh, if I were marooned on a deserted island, you know, could I survive with just minimal tools? And I just talked about this for the first 20 or so years of our marriage. And, Finally, my wife said, if this is your midlife crisis, would you get it over with? <laughs> and so, so I decided to. So I identified an island on Google Earth <laughs> in the middle of the Pacific and the Marshall Islands, halfway between Hawaii and Australia. Got permission from their government and uh, uh, then flew to Hawaii, then Majuro, then Kwajalein, and had a fishing boat take me to this little island about 10 acres big called Jabinwad and dropped me off uh, for a week, no food or water. I just had uh, a few tools to survive, a pole spear and a mask and fin, and a magnifying glass to start fires, and I did take a little desalinator for fresh water. But uh, it was an incredible experience. And uh, four years later, I took my two youngest uh, boys. We had a similar experience. And uh, then uh, two years later, when I got to the Senate, I was so appalled by the lack of bipartisanship. Uh, Martin Heinrich and I, he was elected at the same time I was. He's from New Mexico. Um, he said, why don't we just go to this island or one of these islands and, and uh, prove that Republicans and Democrats can get along. And so we didn't tell any of our colleagues. We planned this for about uh, eight or nine months. And during a congressional recess, August of 2014, uh, but b before that, I. I went to Discovery Channel. I said, uh, hey, you guys do a lot of these films. I said, if we took a GoPro camera, would you want the footage? They said, no, we want to come film it. <laughs> and uh, so this was not naked and afraid. I, <laughs> afraid, yes. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so they, they came and filmed it. But all we had between us was a machete. That was. It's a little dangerous, <laughs> you know. You put Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer on an island with a machete. I, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, but we survived. We, we survived and, and came back and and uh, anyway, we none of our colleagues knew that we'd gone and we walked onto the Senate floor just after it was leaked that we'd done this and it was a lot of disbelief. Then we went on David Letterman. It was one of his last shows that. Bunch of the other shows. Stephen Colbert ran a clip of us you know, spearing fish or whatever. He said, Flake and Heinrich prove once and for all that Republicans and Democrats can get along if death is the only option. <laughs> so, 
So for what it's worth, we've empirically proven it. It, it can't happen. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it is, it, it, it's a real shame in Washington, you know, in years past, uh, generations past, when you were elected to Congress, in the House or the Senate, you moved your family back. And uh, the families of Republicans and Democrats would typically go to the same schools, play on the same sports teams, you know, they worship together on the weekends, recreate together, and the the bonds of friendship that they developed over the weekends, you know, overwhelmed the partisanship during the weekdays, and they could find a way to get along. Um, the trend after jet travel, <laughs> you know, changed things. In fact, Mo Udall, a uh, famous Arizonan who ran for president, uh, he wrote a book called The Job of a Congressman, and I read it the other day, and he said in there, we have enough in our office budget to fly home three times a year, fly home to Arizona, just three times a year. The rest of the time, they were in Washington. That may not always be good for some things. It's good to get home, but as far as camaraderie built and trust among your colleagues, then, then that helped. There's an old saying that uh, you won't question your colleagues' motives when you know the names of his or her children. And, and that's true. And that's why, you know, with like Chris Coons, uh, the, the deal that we struck, or with Martin Heinrich, you know, you, you get to know them when you <laughs> certainly maroon yourself on an island, you don't need to be that extreme. But when you travel, Chris Coons and I traveled a lot in Africa. We both chaired the, the Africa subcommittee. We both spent time there in our youth different parts of the continent and had a lot of shared experiences and sponsored and passed a lot of legislation um, on that. But, but you build up a level of trust when you know each other, and that is lacking these days. Uh, if you don't serve on the same committees or if there's nothing forcing you together in Washington, like uh, you know, being in the House or Senate gym or, or maybe doing, then you can, you can go for months without even talking to some of your colleagues. And it's, uh, it's really not been a good trend. In the 90s, when the Republicans took over the House, uh, Newt Gingrich famously told all the, the freshmen, some 80 of them, uh, don't move to Washington. Keep your families at home uh, because you're going to be campaigning. And, and that really accelerated the trend that was already occurring. Now in Washington, people will, we have a commuter Congress and people come in on a Monday or a Tuesday, depending on when it starts, and are gone by Thursday. And, uh, and so, and you're, you know, you're back uh, at home. There are good parts about that, but you're really missing the camaraderie, and, you, and it's manifested itself, certainly, is what you see today. One thing I would really like your advice on, Senator, as, as uh, was noted at the beginning of tonight's program, we've created a civility center uh, within the Ray C. Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron. And one of our planks in the mission statement says that we are to create a culture of civility. And that includes politics, obviously, being with the Bliss Institute, but it also goes to other areas of our culture, uh, the faith community, uh, education community, so on and so forth. Um, you've been very involved in this. How would you advise us to create a culture of civility? Well, it, I mean, there has to be a commitment on elected officials, certainly, because people look at the top and they see what the president or what senators say and do. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, when Gabby Giffords was shot, Gabby, the congresswoman from Tucson, uh, I was in the house at that time. We were good friends. And uh, we, it was January 8th, I believe it happened. And that year, the State of the Union, which was just a week later, we left a, an empty seat. And the Arizona delegation, Republicans and Democrats, sat together kind of in solidarity. One year later, she had re rehabilitated enough to come back to Washington but only to resign the next day after the State of the Union address. And so uh, I've, I've walked in with her and sat with her during the State of the Union address. She wanted to stand up when President Obama had in his applause lines, as you kind of saw the other day with President Trump. She wanted to stand up but, but couldn't on her own. And so I would help her up, which left me standing, a lone Republican <laughs> in a sea of Democrats. <laughs> 
I got, I can't tell you how many texts and uh, emails and phone calls saying, what are you doing? Why are you agreeing with President Obama? And it was, it was unbelievable, uh, the reaction. And similarly, when, when Tim Kaine was chosen as Hillary Clinton's running mate, uh, Tim and I were elected at the same time. Uh, we disagree on a lot, but uh, he's a smart, good man. <laughs> we worked together on AUMF, Authorization for Use of Military Force. His son, Nat, serves in the military. Uh, he's a good man. And so I, I tweeted out just playfully, now I'm trying to count the ways I hate Tim Kaine. <laughs> I said, but I'm drawing a blank. He's a good man and a good friend. Congratulations. Again, just unhinged fury from my side of the aisle. And I was even at a Republican event in Arizona a couple of days later, and one man actually stood and said, why did you do that? Why did you say that? You know, if you can't say anything bad, don't. And <laughs> he stopped. And, uh, before fully reversing the advice his mother gave him his entire life, I think. But I just thought, this is, this has just gone too far. And then to be on the baseball field uh, when the shots rang out. And uh, to be, I just remember turning to the dugout and running the only safe haven there was and watching the bullets pitch off the gravel in front of me. And, and thinking at that time, uh, why us? Why, how could somebody look out on a bunch of middle-aged men playing baseball or trying to and see the enemy? Uh, it just, it's gone too far. And so I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. And I think it has to start with, with people modeling behavior. And I'm, I'm very troubled by one of the new freshman Democrats, uh, uh, in an unguarded uh, moment, I guess, in a, a speech just a few weeks ago, uh, used some very vulgar language to say that we ought to impeach the president. And since I've, I've been very critical of President uh, Trump when he's used similar language, uh, I put something out saying, you know, this kind of language has no place in politics. Uh, the fact that the president uses this language should be no excuse. There were within two days, 30,000 comments on my tweet, comments, the overwhelming majority saying, if the president speaks this way, so must we. And, and that's, I mean, that's where we are. And so the, the, the real key is to, you, you gotta model that behavior and call out that kind of behavior as well. If we don't, where do we go from here? I mean, where do we go from here? We're going to turn to some questions from the audience. And um, one of them, I think this is very pertinent, especially today. Is there any support in either the House or the Senate for legislation outlawing government shutdowns? <laughs> yes, it has been talked about. There's the constitutionality of it is questioned a bit. But there are ways to do it, and probably the best way is to say that no member of Congress gets paid <laughs> while there's a government <laughs> shutdown. And that would solve it pretty fast. <laughs> These shutdowns never accomplish anything other than, I mean, you delay pay, you end up usually paying it back. You're not, it's not a cost-saving measure. Um, it, but it's just, I mean, it's just the best, the biggest manifestation of our dysfunction right now if we can't even keep the government running. But I, I would be very much in support of legislation that, that simply, uh, one, would, would cut the pay, but two, uh, would simply say if you can't agree, then you would simply continue at the last year's level. And, and that's what we end up doing with these continuing resolutions anyway, but just make that automatic so you don't have these shutdowns. Uh, several questions um, ask about the Judge uh, Kavanaugh hearings, and um, I think we a couple of, of pieces here in that. Um, you were uh, confronted in an elevator um, for several minutes um, b before the vote. Um, just wondering if we could have your thoughts on both that, uh, being confronted like that, what was going through your mind, and then also just on the overall um, confirmation process of, of Judge Kavanaugh. 
Well, thanks. That um, was obviously a, a tough, tough time. And I gave a speech on the Senate floor before the, the hearing that we had, um, just saying, let's give people a chance here. And uh, um, I, I just don't know where people who were certain that she was telling the truth or he was telling the truth. And there could be nothing in between. And, and it, was, it was very difficult to be in the middle of it, I can tell you. And part of our politics now tells us, or the incentives in politics tell you, rush to your corner quickly. Uh, because if you express any notion that you might be influenced by a hearing that's going on or an investigation that's occurring, that you might, heaven forbid, change your mind, then you have angered both sides, not just one. And nobody wants to be in that position. Um, I've lived in that position for a couple of years now. It is an uncomfortable place to be. Uh, but it's where uh, politics really happens. And, and for me, I, I felt, as soon as the allegations came out, um, I insisted that w that she be heard. Uh, we we had to do that, and that didn't make a lot of my Republican uh, colleagues happy. But I felt that she needed to be heard, and we had that hearing. And I was still unsettled about it. I I felt that we ought to advance him out of committee to the full floor. He deserved a full floor vote, but I was still troubled in that I had announced that I would uh, support his nomination in the committee. Um, and then I went to the elevator to go <laughs> to the committee to vote that way and was confronted at that time. And now President Trump and many of my colleagues have said, oh, she was a paid protester and you shouldn't have listened to her and you should have shut her off. To me, she was expressing what I had been hearing for the full week before uh, from family members who I had no idea had gone through what they had gone through. And this, say what you want about who was telling the truth in this instant, it, it validated or it, it struck a nerve, particularly with women. And, and I, I certainly recognized that in the elevator and it, because it was confirming what I had been through uh, that week before. And so when I got to the committee, that's when I went over with Chris Coons and we got an agreement that we ought to have an FBI investigation. Uh, the reasons that were given by my leadership I, I thought were not sufficient as to why we couldn't. Um, and uh, so again, that was, was not a, a, a place you wanted to be. My, my colleagues were not happy, uh, not at all. Uh, but I felt that it was good and I don't ever want to make FBI background checks public. That's, you wouldn't want anybody or nobody would want to subject themselves to that process if that were the case. But I wish the country could have read uh, the report. I think the country would feel better about where some of us landed there. But, uh, but I respect my colleagues who were on the other side and who felt that regardless of what had happened, uh, the, his performance in the committee should have disqualified him. I, I can appreciate that sentiment. But on the flip side of that, people will say, well, if you felt that you were unjustly accused, how would you act? I try to put myself in their shoes and then look at his record uh, on the court 10 years um, on the court and, and to know that not one of his colleagues, even you know his uh, colleagues appointed by Democrats um, or plaintiffs before them or clerks or others who had dealt with him, not one had a contrary thing to say about how he had, um, uh, how he had um, governed himself on that court. And so you had to weigh all of those things but I, I felt good in the end that uh, we insisted on the investigation, and uh, it was a tough time. This confirmation process uh, is it's just not good. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how we get back to the way it was, but it's been tough for a while. Uh, but I, I certainly don't, didn't like the way 
uh, Democrats first, maybe, then Republicans, and then we've just gone like this in terms of getting rid of the filibuster on the president's executive calendar. And so it just, it just means that whoever comes in thinks I've got to appoint more extreme people because they will too. And, and that's not good for the court, and that's not good for the country. Another uh, question that's very pertinent today, um, especially I think given the news the last couple hours, uh, someone asked here about um, your thoughts on what will happen if a national emergency is declared uh, for the border uh, wall. Well, I obviously from Arizona, I understand the need for better border security. Yes, we need better border security. Uh, by the same token, we have been on a schedule to replace border barriers for years now. And the irony is, is uh, what we've had that approximated uh, a wall or the old uh, Vietnam era landing strips that were put on their end and cemented in the ground. Those were a kind of a proper opaque kind of wall like people envision when they talk about what the president wants. Those don't work very well because you can't see through them and people throw rocks over them and we've been replacing them with fences for, <laughs> for quite a while as a better security measure. And so it's, it's interesting sometimes the language that's used is far from the reality on the southern border. Um, but uh, declaring a national emergency and circumventing Congress where Congress has expressed itself specifically saying we don't want this. I don't think has ever been done. You've had national emergencies called for some pretty, you know, sometimes eclectic or odd things, but never to get around what the Congress has expressly said we shouldn't do. Probably the cl closest corollary is when President Obama said the Congress just isn't moving on the Dreamers are on DACA, so I'm going to do an executive order. And what did every Republican in Congress say at that time? You are overstepping your bounds. You, this is not right. And I felt that it wasn't either. I mean, this is in the province of Congress. I liked the end result of what he did. I believe the Dreamers and DACA kids ought to be protected, but that wasn't the way to do it. Um, but in that case, it was just congressional inaction that prompted. Here, Congress has expressly said, don't use the money for this purpose and then he would turn around and use money for that purpose. And so I, I hope that my Republican colleagues uh, would oppose that. And I'm hearing some of them saying that sets bad precedent for a future president, which it does. But the important, most important thing is that it's bad policy now. Uh, regardless of the precedent it might set, um, it, but, and, and it's a little situational ethics if Republicans now say, you know, this would just allow a Democratic president to maybe do an executive order on climate change or something else. Yes, that's a concern, but that's not the reason. This is bad policy now, and we shouldn't do it. We'll uh, do our final question here. Um, what is the future for Jeff Flake? <laughs> right here. <laughs> yeah, that's this kind of thing. Um, you may have seen the... Uh, uh, Two weeks ago, I, uh, I entered a partnership with CBS News to, to do a, a project called Common Ground, and, or a series called Common Ground, where Common Ground may be dead in Washington, but it's alive and well everywhere else. My guess is that the city council of Hudson and <laughs> everywhere else sit together in a bipartisan way or nonpartisan way and work things out. And people do that all the time. Um, there is one great example uh, recently with criminal justice reform that has a happy ending on the federal side. But the real origin of that was in Texas, more than anywhere else, where you had a very diverse group, you know, people who were libertarian or, or um, Fiscal hawks did not want to spend so much money on new prisons. Uh, people in the uh, faith community were concerned about recidivism or people being rehabilitated in prison or not being re rehabilitated. Uh, people were concerned about uh, 
uh, unjust sentencing. That certainly was the case for some of the, but it was a very diverse group that came together, found common ground, passed legislation, and eight years later in Texas, they had closed eight prisons and uh, had lower recidivism rates. And it was not something that we at the national level could not ignore. And uh, so, but there are examples like that all over the country. And that, so that's what that uh, series and that effort is going to try to find. We'll be airing the first one uh, probably within a couple of weeks. So I'll be doing that and uh, spending more time with the grandkids and kids. And uh, um, I have not sworn off politics. Uh, and I may re-enter at some time. But uh, I've done 18 years, uh, 12 in the House and 6 in the Senate. And that's a pretty good run. I know I said that was the final question, but just on that note, could you give us a final memory of your, uh, what was one of your best memories of your years in Congress? Um, I've always had this uh, strange notion, ever, when I entered Congress 18 years ago, there was one policy that Republicans, I thought, were on the wrong side of, and that was Cuba. I've, you know. Republicans have always preached the gospel of engagement and contact and commerce and trade, that that's a way to nudge countries toward democracy. But then we said with Cuba, no, 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 isolate them. That's a, that's a better idea. And I always thought if you want to get rid of the Castro brothers, make them deal with spring break just once or twice. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> let them, <laughs> they would wave the white flags so that's, uh, that's it. So I've been working for years and years to lift the travel ban, especially, just to allow Americans to travel. One, they need to see what it's like to be in a country where socialism is real. That's, that's kind of a deterrent effect. Um, and, and then, two, it would help ordinary Cubans and uh, really launch an entrepreneur class there if they had an opportunity. I was able to pass legislation a couple of times to lift the travel ban. I couldn't get President Bush to sign it. And then when President Obama came in, I couldn't pass it anymore. <laughs> so it was bad timing. But, but, I, but there were some things that he could do legally and justly on an executive level to change the travel ban. Uh, and, but he couldn't really start that process or have diplomatic relations with Cuba until Cuba released a prisoner that they were held holding. Alan Gross, uh, he was a USAID contractor who had been in, in a Cuban prison for five years, uh, convicted as a spy. And uh, I'd been to visit him in Havana uh, in November of 14, and he was at wit's end, just ready to take his own life. And so I got home and told the White House, if you're not negotiating for his release, you better hurry. And they had been, and three weeks later, I was asked if I could be at Andrews Air Force Base on a Wednesday. This was a Monday at 5.30 in the morning. You can't tell your wife or your staff where you're going. And so myself and Pat Leahy, a Democratic senator from Vermont, who had been working on this issue as well, we showed up at Andrews Air Force Base and climbed on one of the president's planes. And there was Judy Gross, Alan's wife. Uh, we'd been working with her to try to get his release. And we were about to engage in an old Cold War era prisoner or spy swap. And this was in 2014, uh, December. And uh, we, so we flew toward Cuba. Another plane took off right after us. It was to pick up a Cuban national who had been a spy for us, who had been in a Cuban prison for 20 years. And then another plane took off from Miami with three convicted Cuban spies who were in our prisons. And all three planes landed at different airfields around Havana. And uh, Pat and I went in and, uh, and got uh, Alan Gross uh, from a room there. And he reunited with his wife. And uh, I went to another room. I met with a foreign minister for a minute. And then we went out to the tarmac and waited for the signal. Exactly 31 minutes after we landed, we took off and headed toward the US. And you ask about the, the favorite moment um, is we, uh, about a half hour into the flight, the pilot came on and said, we've now entered US airspace. And Alan Gross stood up and just shook his fists in the air and then just breathed in and out several times and uh, said, now I know I'm free. And it was just, uh, again, an affirmation 
to me again of what a wonderful, wonderful country we live in. We have huge challenges, uh, but uh, we've had bigger challenges in the past, and uh, this is a wonderful country. So that's my favorite memory. Glad I asked that final question. <laughs>